Well, uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very pleased to be able to um, take the chair for the second session. I'm a little bit concerned that we are running rather late, although, of course, the coffee break is a very important part of any conference. Um, we, we need to um, allow our speakers sufficient time, but they have kindly all agreed to limit themselves to 15 minutes, uh, and I, I'm sure that will be respected. So we, I hope we'll have a little, a little time for some discussion uh, after their contributions without running too late. So without wasting any further time, and I won't um, spend a lot of time uh, giving you the, the biographical data of our speakers, I, I, will, I will mention in relation to our first speaker, uh, Hugo Sibler, uh, who, that he is the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, a post which it involves um, some quite important powers in relation to international arbitration. Prior to that, he had a, a law degree from the Free University of Amsterdam. Uh, and after some military service, he was um, employed in the Netherlands Foreign Office, was subsequently, among other things, um, the Netherlands Ambassador to France. So with great pleasure, I invite uh, Mr. Sibelage uh, to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Sir Francis. And uh, had you uh, given more details about my CV, it would have uh, told the audience that I'm more the average uh, diplomat, uh, whom, as you know, knows a little bit about many topics, but not very much about one topic in particular. So I feel a little bit intimidated here in the presence of professors and judges uh, when I have to speak uh, about arbitration. Um, so, with all due respect, uh, and I hope you will leave uh, some, some time for questioning, but I hope your questions uh, will eventually take that into consideration. Uh, then, good morning, <coughs> distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here today to share with you uh, experiences uh, with international arbitration from the PCA's uh, perspective. This is where we are housed since 1913. Um, the PCA was created in 1899, uh, but this is where we are housed today together with the International Court of Justice. About one mile from this great hall, across the River Thames, stands the Globe Theatre. Around 400 years ago, the Globe held a performance of Shakespeare's Richard II. The second for the opening scene, as you may know, is an arbitration. King Richard has been called upon to resolve a dispute between two noblemen that concerns the fallout from an act of violence and allegations of misuse of state funds. That same play is being performed this week again at the Globe. Like the theater itself, the production has been updated since the 1600s. The new cast is made up entirely of women of color and the production is described, and I quote, as post-empire reflection on what it means to be British in the light of the Windrush anniversary and as we leave the European Union, end of quote. The performance has been acclaimed as a pioneering retelling buzzing with Brexit topicality. Old theater, new actors, new context. This illustrates the theme of my presentation today, which is how the Permanent Court of Arbitration has adapted to accommodate new actors to deal with new challenges. In its 120 years history, the PCA has offered support to tribunals upholding the rule of law for an evolving cast of actors, traditionally states, but today also many international or supranational organizations, the EU included, NGOs, companies, trade unions, and individuals. And it is this flexibility and capacity to adapt to new contexts that allows the PCA to be involved in a variety of instruments relating to modern day concerns. I am referring here not only to the Brexit withdrawal agreement, but also to voids over frontiers, free trade, fisheries, and fast fashion. Allow me to start with some arbitration basics. 
King Richard II, in Shakespeare's account, may not have been the ideal arbitrator from a modern perspective. For one, his independence was dubious. As the cousin of one party, the nephew of the murder victim, and indeed the suspect in the underlying crime. Second, he did not deploy the most sensible measures as arbitrator. When it all got too difficult, he chose to rely on divine intervention and a duel by sorts to resolve the dispute, only to then change his mind again and banish both parties from the kingdom. The key features of arbitration Consent to arbitrate, choice of arbitrators, respect for law, and flexible procedure were meant to memorialize in the PCA's founding instrument, the 1899 Hague Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes. The treaty was the product of the first Hague Convention, uh, conference on, uh, on the peace conference held at the initiative of Tsar uh, Nicholas II of Russia. Our founding fathers envisaged a world governed by the rule of law rather than by force. And obviously, they could not foresee how Europe, 15 years later, uh, sleepwalked into the Great War. The role of arbitration as a means to deal with conflict in international relations relain, remains broadly recognized today. I uh, refer here, for instance, to Article 33 of the UN Charter in Article 188 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. A global institution from the beginning, the PCA nowadays comprises 122 contracting parties, Mongolia being the newest member as of last week. PCA's caseload consists of over 160 pending registry cases involving governments or public entities from over 50 different states. Cases, each decided by different ad hoc tribunals, are administered by an international bureau made up of over 40, 70 lawyers and administrative staff, including fellows under my direction. In the types of disputes envisaged by the PCA's founders, the actors were states, and a prime reason for the re recourse to arbitration administered by the PCA was to avoid armed conflict. It's not an exaggeration to say that even recently, tribunals at the PCA have dealt directly with matters of war and peace. Only last year, Ethiopia finally recognized and implemented in full a decision rendered by a PCA Boundary Commission in 2002, which ultimately brought the resolution of its war with Eritrea. In September last year, a border crossing reopened between the two states for the first time in 20 years. <coughs> The international community has not only resorted to the PCA for interstate conflict, but also for intrastate conflict. A new type of actor emerged in 2009 in the Abidjan arbitration between the central government of Khartoum and the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement slash army, the latter fighting the central government with political and military means. The PCA helped constitute an administrative tribunal that had to decide on the boundary between what is today Sudan and South Sudan, enabling the referendum over South Sudan as part of the uh, UN-sponsored uh, uh, political process uh, on Sudan's, South Sudan's independence to go forward as planned. The Abidjan proceedings illustrate the flexibility of arbitration and how it may creatively be designed by the parties to suit the particular needs of each case. They agreed, for example, on a special appointment procedure with each side nominating two arbitrators and a fifth to be agreed or chosen by the PCA Secretary General from a bespoke list of past and present PCA arbitrators. Second, full transparency. All documents were published, hearings were open, and the first of their kind to be webcast from the Great Hall of Justice in the Peace Palace. And thirdly, a tight time frame due to an impeding referendum, 90 days to issue the award after the hearing. Disputes among states and maritime matters also continue to form a key part of our work, including three pending cases under the already mentioned UNCLOS Convention. The ways in which tribunals have operated in 13 arbitrations under UNCLOS at the PCA illustrate further the flexible procedures available to parties in arbitrations. Hearings, for example, can be arranged anywhere 
In fact, less than half of PCA's hearings are held at our headquarters in the Peace Palace. Different uh, levels of transparency may be agreed uh, by the parties. It has also led to innovating procedures in terms of expert reports and fact-finding. In Guyana versus Suriname, the PCA assisted the tribunal in appointing a hydrographic expert, and PCA staff accompanied him on a site visit to take coordinates of a colonial era boundary <coughs> marker whose location was crucial to the case. The expert reported his findings to the tribunal, which the tribunal then adopted as part of its award. The process of referring discrete tasks to independent technical experts was also used in the South China Sea arbitration and the Arctic Sunrise arbitrations. We have thus seen that flexibility of arbitration allows parties to play a role in creating a process <coughs> suitable to their dispute and in fact making them owners of the process. This may entail devising special appointment procedures, setting strict timeframes, using an established institution for administrative assistance or the tribunal referring discrete, discrete issues to a separate entity. Those of you who managed to read up to page 576 of the draft withdrawal agreement may recognize that these were all aspects of the dispute settlement procedures negotiated by the UK government and the EU in November 2018. Given the uncertainties surrounding even today uh, Brexit, I will refrain from going into any detail. But let me, however, mention uh, one particular aspect of some interest, I think, also to the debate today, uh, i.e. Article 174, which provides that where a dispute, and I quote, raises a question of interpretation of a concept of European Union law, the arbitral panel shall not decide such question, but shall request the Court of Justice of the European Union to give a ruling on the question, which the arbitral panel must then follow." End of quote. And similar mechanisms are included in the uh, November 2018 draft framework agreement uh, proposed by the EU to Switzerland. Flexibility is indeed particularly relevant to accommodate a variety of new actors on the PCA stage, increasingly non-state ones, which nowadays rely on arbitration as a tool for dispute settlement. It will be of interest for this audience that in 2013, the PCA administered the first international proceeding in which the EU participated as in its own right, the Faroe Islands versus the European Union, regarding shared stock of atlanto scanian herring. European and intergovernmental organizations have indeed become an important category of users of PCA proceedings, which now counts 33 <coughs> cases with intergovernmental organizations as parties. But there is more. The groundbreaking conciliation between Timor-Leste and Australia that led to a new maritime boundary treaty last year, interestingly engaged with a private actor, the Operation Sunrise Joint Venture, which had been granted concession rights to exploit natural gas in the disputed area. It is the involvement of such private actors and foreign investors in particular, to which I now briefly turn in the context of investor state arbitration and business and human rights arbitration. First, investor state. In the last 20 years, the PCA has administered nearly 200 of such arbitrations. Some well-known examples include Philip Morris versus Australia, Chevron versus Ecuador, Achmea versus the Slovak Republic, Yukos versus the Russian Federation, several NAFTA cases, and a recent, recent slew of renewable energy-related disputes involving European states. How did the PCA become involved with these so-called mixed arbitrations, where one of the parties is a private entity or person? <coughs> Some of the PCA's early state-to-state -state disputes concerned, in fact, the interests of private individuals or entities. Their states of nationality defended those interests as if their own. Such cases can be considered the precursors to modern investment arbitration. And then, so authorized by its contracting parties, in the late 1920s, the PCA for the first time administered an arbitration directly opposing a private entity in the state in Radio Corporation of America versus China, which involved a claim to exclusive broadcasting rights. 
The case set a precedent for the handling of disputes between private parties and states founded on contracts and later investment treaties. Nowadays, the majority of all known unsuitual investor state proceedings are administered by the PCA, with 106 of them pending to date. As with interstate disputes, these mixed arbitrations enjoy a large degree of procedural flexibility and have accommodated a new range of actors. Non-parties, including the European Commission and NGOs, have provided submissions to tribunals in NAFTA, ECT and BIT cases. Investment tribunals have retained independent experts on matters of environmental damage, forensic analysis and calculation of damages. Hearings have been held all over the world to suit the needs of the parties and participants, including in states where the PCA has concluded so-called host country agreements. One most recent such agreement uh, was signed last week, two weeks ago, sorry, with the Republic of Ireland, which hopes after Brexit to, um, to be the hub uh, as a common law, the only remaining common law in English-speaking country in the European Union, which provides participants to PCA hearings uh, the same privileges and immunities in Ireland that they have in the Netherlands under our headquarters agreement, in addition to free hearing facilities in Dublin. And I should add that a similar proposal is under consideration at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. In three cases, uh, the parties have chosen to apply UNCITRAL 2013 transparency rules, even though they might not automatically have applied. Plenty has been said already and will be said probably uh, later today, tomorrow, about ISDS reform. PCA takes no stance as to the desirability of particular reforms in the ISDS system. In our view, it is the prerogative of governments and or the European Union to select the dispute settlement mechanism that they regard most appropriate, taking into account their policy preferences and interests. That said, Given the depth of our relevant experience, uh, we are participating in the UNCTRAL process in an effort to assist states ensuring that any new approaches lead to efficient and fair dispute resolution mechanisms. And just as some form of station identification or page de pub, I should say that we believe that the PCA could easily render the kind of registry services also to a multilateral investment court and or appeal mechanism. What remains in that context, perhaps underexplored, is the possibility of mediating investment disputes. The PCA has supported the work of a number of projects to develop rules and guides on investment mediations. We have also recently administered three conciliations, <coughs> including one between private parties under the PCA's conciliation rules for environmental disputes. This takes me to my final observation, Chair, uh, about new actors at the PCA. In 2016, two arbitrations were commenced at the PCA under the Bangladesh Accord on fire and building safety by two labor unions against two global fashion brands. This accord is a unique instrument negotiated in the aftermath of the 2013 Rana Plaza factory collapse that killed over 100, uh, 1, 1,100 factory <coughs> workers in the ready-made garment industry. It aims to enable a working environment in which no worker needs to fear fires, building collapses or other accidents by establishing a safety inspection regime and obligations on signatory brands to ensure that supplier factories comply. The accord also features a binding arbitration clause and that clause, um, under that clause the PCA was asked to appoint the chair of the arbitral tribunal and act as registry. Tribunal acknowledged genuine public interest at stake in the proceedings when, rulings, when ruling on a transparency and confidentiality regime. The case is settled last year before going to hearing. Their outcomes were welcomed as, and I quote, proof that legally binding mechanisms can hold multinational companies to account. End of quote. The new 2018 Bangladesh Accord incorporates the UNCTRAL rules, provides for the Hague as the seat of arbitration, and specifies the PCA as the administering institution. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I hope not only to have demonstrated 
that a PCA would be the natural choice indeed for registry and appointing authority services under the uh, withdrawal agreement. Uh, but I also hope to have demonstrated that we are in respect of arbitration, uh, like the Globe Theatre in respect of a play by Shakespeare, uh, can provide a new stage to new actors in the context of new challenges. Arbitration is an extremely flexible instrument. Not only does it allow parties maximum ownership of the process to which they have submitted, it also allows new parties to participate in the system. International relations no longer exclusively belong to states. This phenomenon plays out in different ways. International organizations increasingly involve large companies in their operations simply because these, these companies bring capabilities that intergovernmental organizations lack. Non-governmental organizations are main actors in the debate concerning public goods at the international level. Arbitration fully plays its role in that development. I thank you. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, a remarkable amount of material in a limited time and um, really giving us an overview of the uh, role of arbitration, the advantages of arbitration and recent developments in the system. Um, we now um, move on to a, a very different area of the rule of law. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Fausto Pocar, who is Professor Emeritus of International Law in the University of Milan, where he also taught private international law and European law. He was also on the United <coughs> Nations Commission on, on Human Rights and um, became, um, he became uh, in 1999 uh, judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, was president of that tribunal from 2005 to 2008, was also a member of the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and he is going to speak on the role of United Nations courts in building the international rule of law. Thank you, Professor Pokor. Yes, thank you, um, and um, let me first uh, thank very briefly uh, the organizers of, the, of this meeting for having invited me. I will not spend many words on that because we have a limited time. And uh, I will not even read my presentation. We leave it for the um, collection that will be done later in, uh, and published in a, in a book. Uh, I will prefer now to dwell on a couple of issues, present a couple of issues, and uh, take into account also what uh, has been um, discussed in the previous panel, as uh, we are again on the rule of law in this panel. Uh, and the contribution that may have been given by international courts and tribunals to, in upholding the rule of law. And uh, the um, first point I want to raise, uh, uh, what rule of law are we speaking of? Are we speaking, uh, we heard this morning there is a EU rule of law, there is an international rule of law, there is there are other concepts of, of rule of law, but is there really an international rule of law, or uh, only a closed system may have really a, an independent system may have a rule of law. Uh, I will not go into all the discussion on, the, on this matter. It's a long discussion whether there is a rule of law. But in um, assessing the contribution given by courts and tribunals to the rule of law, it can only be the, in, the rule of law in the system in which uh, this, uh, uh, in the legal order in which these courts and tribunals operate. And uh, in reality, uh, depending on whether we look uh, with a positivist approach to international law and to the sources of international law, or we consider, as some scholars start to consider, that uh, the presence of other actors and not just the states in the international environment, creates a, a sort of a informal soft law that also has to be taken into account in assessing the rule of law. Uh, we may come to different conclusions on that, and I will, at the end, 
of what I say, I will come to some conclusion in this uh, respect. But for the time being, I try to remain with the traditional concept of rule of law, as if in the international <coughs> system it could be really applied like uh, Dicey applied it in, uh, in uh, this country. Now, uh, if we take this notion, it is certain that, among other aspects, the uh, rule of law includes the primary of the law, the primacy of the law, of course, of a law that is just and equitable, and uh, uh, that should be applied by an independent and impartial judiciary, coherently, consistently, in order to ensure predictability to the um, subjects in the community. Now, what happens in the international system? That we have, and had especially recently, a, a proliferation of international jurisdictions. No system has so many jurisdictions as the international system nowadays. Uh, in addition, we have to consider domestic systems that apply international law. So international law is applied by so many jurisdictions that uh, the, the risk of having uh, a international law completely fragmented has been, uh, uh, has been uh, raised by uh, many, by many uh, scholars. Now, how to, uh, if you want a, a rule of law that, uh, that is predictable, where the law is predictable, where the law is consistently, coherently applied, how do we proceed? What do we do? Are we harmonizing the jurisdictions, finding a hierarchy in the jurisdiction? This was the, the position that had been taken by the, by the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, at a certain moment. Had a, the ICJ had a controversy with the ICTY, and uh, the president of the ICJ wrote several times and uh, expressed the view in several meetings that uh, the, a hierarchy should be established whereby the International Court of Justice, which is under the Charter of the UN, the uh, principal judicial body of the United Nations, should have priority. And uh, he even advised to give uh, that court by all jurisdictions that could be established a sort of uh, preliminary ruling uh, competence, like the uh, uh, EU Court of Justice, to express uh, the interpret in the interpretation of international law. Um, uh, his uh, his uh, position didn't have uh, success, of course, uh, but uh, it's interesting that uh, instead of that, uh, the controversy was resolved through a dialogue among the courts, between the courts. And uh, the dialogue was, the, the, the controversy was quite uh, interesting on the application, it was a matter of a law of war. When do you have an international conflict? And when do you have a domestic conflict? Is the conflict is domestic, essentially. But uh, one of the parties going against the government is supported by an external state, by another state. What kind of support must there be for the conflict to become from national, international? And uh, the, uh, the ICJ had expressed the view in the Nicaragua case that uh, the, uh, the conflict would become international if the, um, if the state, the third state, has a effective control over the party fighting against the government. Um, the ICTY had adopted a completely different view in saying the conflict is international if there is an overall control, which is more flexible, clearer than uh, the NIPO. Um, this created the reaction, of course, of the president of the, of the ICJ, but at the end, uh, the, there was no problem. And maybe the ICTY made a mistake in uh, saying that the court uh, of justice was wrong, because it was not necessary. And at the end, uh, the solution was found by the president of the ICJ, 
uh, Dame Rosalind Higgins in the, in the case of genocide, saying, well, we have the notion of international conflict. It depends for what purpose. The ICJ had to decide on that to establish whether the third state was responsible for the activities in the conflict. The ICTY only had to establish whether criminal law applied or not to uh, international rules on criminal uh, matters applied as an international conflict or not. Simply the Geneva Conventions applied or not in that context. So the purpose was completely different and the solution was found that way. So that's why I think uh, uh, through a dialogue, uh, this is just one case, but there are many other cases, uh, through a dialogue you can resolve almost all the problems with, the, with that. Not only there is a, an advantage in not having one jurisdiction, but having many jurisdictions. Because, uh, and I come again to the rule of law, there is no well-established rule of law in international law. That's quite clear. There are too many institutions, too many uh, systems, internal systems they work, so they cannot agree on anything in the rule of law. The United Nations itself, uh, has adopted resolutions on the rule of law, but have not succeeded in establishing a rule of law. Uh, we, we always speak, if we take the dicey position, that the law should be just and equitable. Is international law just and equitable? I don't know how many people would say, yes, it is just and equitable. When the UN themselves predicate and impose on states to respect the rule of law, but they don't respect it themselves. If they damage, create a damage somewhere, could even commit crimes, they are not responding for that. <coughs> even if they commit an international crime, the, the contribution that may have been given to the genocide in Srebrenica by the United Nations or the absence of reaction of the United Nations, they were there, at the end, led to nothing because uh, the UN opposed immunity to the jurisdiction, to the uh, Dutch jurisdiction that was dealing with that matter. So at the end, uh, is there a rule of law? For the EU, it will be different. The institution may have responsibility, but uh, uh, the UN have not. So having a dialogue between the courts, and here is the responsibility of the courts, uh, they make the law progress maybe in the sense of establishing a rule of law. And it's a, the great responsibility is the courts in going in that direction. Human rights courts have done it to a certain extent, but even the ICTY, even the case has done it on the international conflict, because isn't that a principle, if you apply the rule of law, that the violators of the rule of law should be punished? If it's criminal the violation is a principle on respect of the law. And uh, a, a system based on the rule of law should provide for that. And if uh, the system had to be applied in a restrictive way, as the ICJ was doing, you are not going in favor of the rule of law. Nowadays, nobody challenges the position of the ICTY on that matter. But it means that the law is progressing and we have to take into account that the international system is to a large extent based not on written law, but it is based on customary law. And in customary law, the role of jurisdictions in adopting a position, in uh, making progress and trying to bring, uh, uh, to develop the law is extremely, is extremely uh, important. Uh, sometimes we approach, uh, especially in, on the continent, this uh, problem uh, more on the basis of written law, of written international law, than on uh, uh, customary international law. But customary international law remains the basic law for all the international community. I stop here, I don't want to go beyond, I wanted just to raise these two issues <coughs> and uh, bring the problem to the attention of the audience. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much again for compressing your talk and 
covering within um, a limited time such an interesting range of issues and the problems posed by the multiplication of international tribunals when we are talking about the rule of law, but if we have the rule of law interpreted in different ways in, by different courts, it, it would have to be the rule of laws, I suppose, to some extent. Another problem with the European Court of Human Rights, which is being given jurisdiction to give preliminary rulings, um, even though the convention itself does not require uniform interpretation. So we have, I think, a lot of problems here and some very good illustrations. It's now a great pleasure to turn to a topic which is outside the European Union, on which we've mainly been focused, looking at the comparison between enforcement in the European Union and enforcement in the EEA system. And we have as our speaker uh, an expert because he is from the EFTA College, uh, which consists simply of one member from each of the three um, con member states concerned, uh, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. And um, Dr. Buchel has been, uh, since 2004, a member of the EFTA College from Liechtenstein. After um, many appointments in Liechtenstein and also among his academic qualifications, a diploma from Centre of European Law at King's College. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, indeed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests, my focus today is judicial protection in the European Economic Area, the EEA, and I'm grateful to Her Majesty's government for spending these past three years on educating the general public on a fair few aspects of the EEA. So my task, uh, this should make my task really easier today. The EEA remains, even after 25 years, the European Union's most advanced and most comprehensive free trade agreement. The Norwegian Prime Minister recently described it as the world's best trade agreement. As a Liechtensteiner, I would certainly agree. The EA agreement may in some respects be the embodiment of a less far-reaching vision of European integration. It does not envisage an ever closer union of the people of Europe. It excuse any attempt at creating a single European polity. We are about economic integration on the same terms as the European Union, but without political integration. Yet, and this is important, and also in the context of the ongoing Brexit debate, the deep economic integration and cooperation between advanced economies, exemplified by the European Economic Area, is necessarily based on common values and a high degree of mutual trust. You simply cannot build an internal market on self-interest alone. You cannot even build it on mutual economic interest alone, just because, for example, Liechtenstein companies are, are among the world's leading manufacturers of dental products and power tools, and just because its GDP per capita is probably the highest in the world, and it is with close to 40% of its economy, the most highly industrialized country in Europe, that does not mean that we would be able to negotiate the complete market access we have today to the internal market. To understand why that is, one first has to explain what makes the EU's internal market so special and what sets it apart from other free trade agreements. The EU's internal market, which the EA agreement extends to the three EAFTA states, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway, is an area without internal frontiers in which the free movement of goods, persons, services and capital is ensured. For me, the internal market is also about people. And it's not just about making the big deals possible, but also about removing the small, everyday obstacles to free movement. To bring this about, of course, tariffs and regulatory obstacles must be tackled, but also the multitude of smaller obstacles, which mean that it still makes a difference in which European country one is, everything from roaming charges or the recognition of diplomas or the need to set up a new bank account. Incidentally, these obstacles increasingly originate beyond national regulations in the form of barriers erected along national borders by private companies. In the pursuit of profit maximization, cross-border transactions often incur additional charges or prices or products differ in better or worse uh, of markets. As legislative barriers are rolled back, they should not be replaced by equally restrictive measures taken by private companies. 
The fact that the internal market goal aims at more ambitious market integration than tra traditional free trade agreements is reflected in the institutional and procedural framework. There are two enforcement mechanisms in the EAFTA model which are not commonly found in ordinary free trade agreements. Firstly, enforceable rights are given directly to people. <coughs> EA law transposed into the national legal orders can be relied upon by anyone in front of national courts to enforce rights. Where EA law is incorrectly implemented, a damages remedy is available in the national courts against that state. The national courts and individuals are thus the cornerstone of the system rather than an intra, inter or supranational court uh, and the states. Secondly, there is an independent surveillance mechanism. The EFTA pillar is self-policing. In new member states, the commission is guardian of the treaties. In the EFTA states, the EFTA surveillance authority, my authority, fulfills that task, enjoying broadly the same powers as and often cooperating uh, with the commission. Enforcement by an organization charged with compliance is particularly important where there are obstacles that are small enough that individuals may not launch an expensive enforcement, enforcement action. An independent surveillance mechanism can also be important where fundamental values of society, such, such as environmental standards or general protection, are an issue or indeed the rule of law. I have to confess that it has not always endeared us to the national administrations or indeed is easily understood by citizens or journalists when we investigate minor restrictions to free movement. However, in principle, the benefits of the internal market require reducing all obstacles to free movement and in practice, restrictions are rarely isolated and may have wider chilling effect on people deciding to exercise free movement rights. Finally and crucially, if we as the authorities specifically entrusted with these tasks do not take up the matter, then who will? Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to protecting the rule of law, monitoring by an independent authority such as the Commission and the EFTA Surveillance Authority clearly has a salutary effect. We would of course all like to think that our own states are immune from rule of law deviations, but only last week the European Court of Human Rights found that Iceland had infringed Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights in selecting the judges for a newly established Court of Appeal. The Court found that the process had amounted to a flagrant breach of the applicable rules at the material time. Uh, it had been, and I quote, to the detriment of the confidence that the judiciary in a democratic society must inspire in the public and had contravened the very essence of the principle that a tribunal must be established by law. I should also mention that there is currently a case pending in Strasbourg against Norway where the EFTA court's standing requirements uh, are being challenged as, as regards the right of access to a tribunal under Article 6 of the Convention. The EFTA surveillance authority has taken a very real interest in this matter, submitting an explanation to the Strasbourg court on how access to justice uh, is ensured in the EA court system. The EA legal system is strengthened by being subject to judicial scrutiny on human rights. Furthermore, my authority monitors rule of law issues particularly closely when they relate to the enforcement of the EA agreements, be it within the EFTA, the EFTA or the EU states. This means we ensure that appointments to the EFTA court are made in accordance with the rules and of course we more generally seek to uphold the independence of both the EFTA court and our own institution. All national courts within the EU EA system operate in a European capacity when applying the law derived from the respective treaties. It is essential that they are able to fill their function having regard to the law only and free from any direct or indirect external influence. In this regard, the EFTA surveillance authority has been following the Commission's infringement action against Poland on the independence of Polish Supreme Court and two days ago submitted observations to the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice of the EU in a reference for a preliminary ruling on the same matter 
as regards why we consider the reforms of the Polish judiciary to be problematic. It should be clear from our earlier comments why the after surveillance authority is so concerned about these matters. It is not just about access to justice in concrete individual cases. Problems in access to justice in an EA state would profoundly affect the position of individuals and economic operators from other EA states seeking to assert their internal market rights, both abroad and at home. The internal market is distinguishable from less ambitious trade deals by the fact that EA law confers enforceable rights on individuals, coupled with the rule of law and judicial and institutional dialogue. This gives confidence to individuals and economic operators to treat the whole of the EA as their home. If the rule of law is compromised, their trust to exercise or enforce their rights is undermined. Observance of the rule of law by way of the independence of the judiciary and access to justice is at the very core of democracy and as Professor Trimidas referred to it, a constitutional essential. <laughs> and it is essential to upholding highest human rights standards. We see this reflected in the political debate in the EU, EU these days. Safeguarding the rule of law is not only a precondition for a well-functioning European Union, it is a preconditioning for close economic integration in the entire Euro European economic area as well, and by necess necessity a shared core value. Although the legal order established by the EA agreement differs in many respects from the EU legal order and pursues a less far-reaching level of integration, these differences do not, at any rate, extend to the very foundations and values on which both legal orders are based. More specifically, both legal orders are based equally and fundamentally on the respect for the rule of law in all its emanations. As is affirmed in the preamble to the EA agreement, the relationship between the EU its member states and the EFTA states is based on long-standing common values and European identity. You will not find the agreement and the express equivalent articles to Articles 2 and 7 of the Treaty on European Union, but the values enshrined and protected by those provisions are no less part of the EA legal order. They underpin our operation and existence. It is clear that respect for the values <coughs> enunciated expressly in the Treaty on European Union equally are preconditions for participation in the EA. The fact that these same fundamental values are shared across the EA is the principal reason why the self-policing aspect of the EA agreement works without the need for any cross pillar checks and balances. There is no after judge on the Court of Justice of the European Union and there is no EU judge on the after court even when these courts adjudicate, say, on the rights of a Liechtensteiner receiving health care in Spain. It is rather instructive to contrast this self-policing approach based on deep mutual trust under the EA agreement with the approach being currently put forward by the EU in other contexts. Both the withdrawal agreement with the UK and the draft institutional agreement with Switzerland provide, provide for less freedom and require closer alignment, notably with the case law of the Court of Justice. Under the EA agreement, first, it is only the Court of Justice of the uh, European Union's case law prior to signature of the agreement, which is actually binding. Second, as regards later case law, it is only the EFTA states who have unilaterally asked the EFTA court to pay due account uh, to the Court of Justice's rulings. And thirdly, it is only with the consent of contracting parties that a court of justice may be asked to give a ruling on the interpretation of EA law, which are identical in substance uh, to union law. Any divergence of views between the courts is ultimately resolved through judicial dialogue. But that is the topic of tomorrow's uh, panel, so I don't need to venture uh, there now. But let me hasten to say both my institution and the after court are instrumental in ensuring cohesion and homogeneity of the internal market. This is essential for the credibility of our pillar and of the EA agreement. Why is this so? Because the features of the institutional and judicial protection framework in the EA, to my mind, exemplify 
the deeply shared common values, and the high degree of mutual trust between the EU and EFTA states. None of this would be possible without the deeply rooted respect for the rule of law, but once that respect is there, everything else falls into place, making a lot of the safeguards lawyers may think of practically, may think of practically unnecessary. This starts with the rights of the citizen and the ability to exercise those rights directly. And this is the ultimate illustration of the principle recognized by the European Parliament, and I quote, that developed economies with properly functioning judiciaries render the need for investor state dispute settlement mechanisms less important. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much indeed. Again, uh, a fascinating area, the relationship between the uh, EU system and the EFTA system is an extremely close one, and yet there are circumstances in which the same provisions are liable to be interpreted in a rather different way in the, in the two systems. And uh, this provides, I think, a very um, interesting example of the way in which the rule of law has to be, if you like, uh, qualified. Yeah, one has to look in the law in its context. Well, we come now to um, David Brinmore Thomas, uh, Queen's Counsel, whose practice um, uh, makes him an expert on international commercial arbitration. He has done a good deal of work in the United Nations uh, International uh, uh, Trade Law Commission uh, on the model, rule, model law on arbitration and on the arbitration rules. Uh, he has advised me to be very short in giving you an account of his um, expertise. Uh, it will emerge from his talk. Uh, and I understand that he's going to focus in particular today on enforcing human rights obligations. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that um, introduction. First of all, a brief apology um, to our hosts. Uh, I propose this afternoon to discuss uh, the way in which investment treaty tribunals are taking account or beginning to take account of human rights law and international human rights law. <clears throat> that means that the jurisprudence that I will be discussing uh, will not be European Union jurisprudence. Um, that means that I must apologize to my hosts, uh, but it does have the benefit that this talk may have some currency, at least in London after the 22nd of May. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a New Zealand academic, Gemma Roden, uh, wrote a paper in International Company and Commercial Law Review last year entitled The Justification for the Creation of a World Investment Court. One of the justifications that she articulated uh, was uh, that investment treaty arbitration tribunals uh, tend not to take account of all elements of public international law and in particular uh, the enforcement of human rights. She developed that with other arguments to say that there should be uh, an international court which, which would take account of such uh, bodies. <clears throat> the stereotypical narrative for an investment treaty case, the political narrative, if you like, uh, is on the one hand um, a multinational corporation that is granted a license to exploit assets by a government. The government then changes the new government um, in the host country, seeks to control the corporation's behavior, uh, finds that it is uh, censured uh, by an investment treaty tribunal, um, by an investment treaty tribunal uh, in relation to the control measure that it's taking and it is required to pay compensation. The, the, the flip side of that, which multinational corporations articulate, uh, is that uh, they comply with all local uh, legal requirements permits, conditions of licenses, and the like, and so the interference by the host state is uh, impermissible. They point to revenue, taxation, benefits, and the like. One of the issues that has arisen is the fact that that is a relationship uh, between the investor and the host state, or the host state government. Um, an issue that arises from that is no account sometimes has been taken of the interests of local communities in relation to the investments that are uh, made. An example of that might be, and I'm not going to <coughs> delve into this at all, but would, might include Chevron and Ecuador. 
uh, in which the local population would claim to have been let down by their own government, uh, Chevron arguing that uh, they completed all cleanup and remediation works that they had agreed to, pointing to the relevant judgments and awards made uh, in the dispute between Chevron and Ecuador, but with local communities saying, no, 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 we're left, we're left out of this. Um, clearly, local communities are not direct parties to the investment treaty. They are advancing their interests through their representative government. But those local communities may consider that local or national remedies are in fact inaccessible or insufficient. Uh, an example of that is the attempted litigation uh, by individuals from the Niger Delta to seek to sue Shell in London rather than bringing proceedings in Nigeria because of the mismatch in their uh, rights and interests. Further, they may actually uh, have difficulty persuading a government to advance their uh, interests. Um, that sort of interest, which tends to be given a human rights narrative, is receiving increasing attention. The new Dutch model BIT <clears throat> has actually uh, includes text uh, which provides that a tribunal um, is able to take into account a failure to comply with commitments under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines for multinational uh, enterprises. That is a discretion, but it is a discretion which under the uh, model bit um, is one to, uh, that allows the tribunal to reduce the amount of compensation that the investor is able to obtain. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that those instruments that I've just identified are it's already been referred to as soft law. And they distinguish between the government's obligations and the investor's role. Uh, the preamble uh, to the UNGP uh, provides these guiding principles are grounded in recognition of states' existing obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. The role of business enterprises as specialized organs of society performing specialized functions required to comply with all applicable laws and respect human rights. There is a distinction there between that which the state is, as conceived, required to do and that which uh, investors are encouraged to do. And that's reflected in the guiding principles themselves, uh, which provide states must protect against human rights abuse, uh, abuse uh, in contrast to business enterprises should respect uh, human rights. Um, and indeed, that's reflected in a recent paper uh, by John Ruggie uh, and Sherman in relation to uh, the guidelines in which they wrote uh, it, which is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, is rooted in a transnational social norm, not an international legal norm. It serves to meet a company's social license to operate, not its legal license. It exists over and above all applicable legal requirements and it applies irrespective of what states do or do not. Bear in mind that reference that I just quoted to social license to operate. I'll come back to that. Um, there have been our attempts to conflate those two elements uh, of the UNGP. Um, they are likely not to succeed. Um, they are particularly likely not to succeed, I suggest, in front of uh, some of the more pragmatically constituted investment treaty tribunals uh, that are sometimes seen in the jurisprudence. So what tools are tribunals beginning to use, or what tools can parties seek to have uh, to enforce human rights obligations in investor uh, state arbitration? Well, just developing it, the, 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 the sort of start of the piece of string, I suggest, <clears throat> is um, the decision of uh, the ICSID, um, in the ICSID annulment decision in Tulip and Turkey. Now, in that, in interpreting the uh, ICSID convention, the ad hoc committee relied on the Vienna Convention so as to interpret uh, the uh, ICSID convention, and in doing so, incorporated uh, concepts of international human rights. And that's expressly in the uh, decision. Um, that, however, was simply procedural. That was a way to interpret uh, that which had 
ha happened in the um, arbitration. Um, more interesting in terms of uh, substantive uh, steps uh, is the decision in Bear Creek in the Republic of Peru where the tribunal didn't rely on the Vienna Convention because the Canada-Peru agreement itself provided that the tribunal should decide issues in dispute in accordance with this agreement and applicable rules of international law. The rules that were agreed by both parties uh, to be relevant uh, were the International Labour Organization's Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples. The majority decision uh, awarded the investor <coughs> um, its preparatory uh, expenses and its sunk costs. It refused to award damages on the basis of uh, a discounted cash flow con uh, calculation on the basis that the investment was still too speculative. But Philip Sands gave a dissenting opinion in which he said he would reduce those damages by a further 50%. And he did that on the basis of a social license to operate. He said, uh, yet the fact that the Convention on Indigenous Peoples may not impose obligations directly on a private foreign investor as such does not, however, mean that it is without significant or legal effects for them. In Urbas and Argentina, the tribunal noted that human rights relating to dignity and adequate housing and living conditions are complemented by an obligation on all parts, public and private parties, not to engage in activity aimed at destroying such rights. As an international investor, the claimant has legitimate interests and rights under international law, so far so conventional. Local communities of indigenous and tribal peoples also have rights under international law, and these are not lesser rights. And these are not lesser rights. Um, Philip Sands drew on Urbasser and Argentina. Um, that was a case uh, in which there was an obligation uh, it was actually a project for the provision of uh, water. Um, there was a, a counterclaim by the host government, uh, and the which the tribunal uh, actually said uh, the relevant bit did not indicate that a state party could not sue an investor. Uh, that was on the construction of the bit. Um, the tribunal also resisted the suggestion that a claim founded in international human rights law could not be applied to the claimant investor. Uh, without going into matters at length, the tribunal rejected a suggestion that international human rights law could impose a positive obligation on the investor. Uh, but it did say uh, that it could impose a negative uh, obligation on the investor. International law accepts corporate social responsibility as a standard of crucial importance for companies operating in the field of international commerce. The standard includes commitments to comply with human rights. It went on, they are not on their own sufficient to oblige companies to put their policies in line with human rights uh, law. Um, however, the, what the tribunal final, finally said uh, is the situation would be different in the case of an obligation to abstain, like a prohibition to commit acts violating human rights uh, would be at stake. Um, Urbas was also relied on in <clears throat> um, Avon in Costa Rica, uh, which was a question of uh, a case where uh, the investor's case failed uh, as, uh, on the uh, basis of uh, contravention of certain environmental uh, regulations. That tribunal uh, said, this tribunal shares the views of the Urbas tribunal that it can no longer be admitted that investors operating internationally are immune from becoming subjects of international law. It is pertinent to recall the observation of the International Court of Justice regarding this kind of obligation. In view of the importance of the rights involved, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection. They are obligations erga omnes. That tribunal rejected uh, the counterclaim, but it rejected that counterclaim, in fact, the counterclaim that was advanced uh, on the basis of uh, the way in which it had been pleaded and advanced under the UNCTRAL uh, rules. Now, I mentioned uh, the matter raised in Bear Creek uh, and the commentary on the UNGP, which was the concept of a social license to operate. This is a concept which emerged in the 1990s in Australia in relation to the mining industry, 
but is now written about, for example, in relation to domestic fisheries industries uh, or has been referred to politically uh, in relation to the obligations of electricity suppliers. It's been described without local support, oil and gas activities would be unable to operate within standards of safety because local skills and human resources are part of the process of maintaining the social license to operate and managing the environmental social impacts. Um, what John Ruggie says is that the concept is now a core part of what is seen as the obligations on multinational companies uh, to comply with obligations in respect of uh, human rights. Um, and in Bear Creek, the dissent uh, firmly put the onus on the shoulders of the investor. It is for the investor to obtain the social license. And in this case, it was unable to do so largely because of its own failures. The Canada-Peru FTA is not any more than ICSID, an insurance policy against the failure of an inadequately prepared investor to obtain such license. Um, that concept was also raised uh, in Copper Mesa and Ecuador, and I see the chairman of that has just walked in, as happens, um, where the question of whether the claimant mining company had obtained a social license. Now, the tribunal in that case didn't in fact refer expressly to uh, obtaining a social license to operate. Um, it concluded that where the claimant, and it's worth reading for those of you who haven't, by its local agents had resorted to recruiting armed men, firing guns, spraying mace civilians as part of an orchestrated plan to break up protests against their operations, it con contributed to its own loss uh, in the amount of 30%. And the tribunal took account of that in, in find, making a finding that there was contributory fault on the part of the claimant. So ladies and gentlemen, in my submission, it seems that tribunals are increasingly willing to investigate questions of international human rights law when considering claims by investors before investment uh, tribunals. Um, there appears to be an openness to considering uh, counterclaims uh, un uh, made by states. The difficulty remains that there is no freestanding right under the typical bilateral treaty uh, for individual citizens to raise a claim uh, under a treaty. Um, enforcement of rights is therefore inevitably still reliant uh, either on state action uh, by way of a counterclaim uh, in a claim invested, uh, made by an investor uh, or by the admission of uh, some sort of uh, amicus uh, argument. But that is taking matters an awful lot further than uh, they have presently reached. However, I suggest that although the conventional view has been uh, that counterclaims are not admissible and that it is difficult, if not impossible, uh, for governments to bring in uh, concepts such as international human rights uh, into the defense uh, of uh, investment treaty claims. Um, the present or recent behavior of uh, tribunals and all of the decisions that I've cited uh, are since 2014 or 2015 uh, suggests otherwise. Thank you. Very much indeed again for the most interesting presentation and uh, the uh, development of new doctrines coming into um, uh, awards in where human rights issues arise and we must move on straight away to our final speaker Federico Ortino um, I'm glad to say from the law school at King's College London where he is reader in international economic law and also a great specialist in investment uh, international investment law he has done a great deal of work on that with um, numerous bodies, uh, which are too numerous to mention. Uh, his, his title today is WTO DSU, A Curse or a Bliss for International Trade Relations. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Francis. And, and thank you, the organizers, for uh, inviting me. And in fact, uh, setting these questions to me, which is a brilliant question. Uh, WTO dispute settlement, a curse or a bliss? Now, until recently, uh, anyone approaching the WTO, and particularly the WTO dispute settlement system, uh, would probably found a, a very idyllic uh, picture, a bliss. Why is that? Um, 
Well, along those lines, uh, perhaps uh, one should remember uh, a former uh, director general of the WTO, Pascal Lamy, uh, referring to or describing the WTO dispute settlement system as the jewel in the crown of the WTO. Uh, Professor Carl-Sieter Ehlermann, uh, one of the original uh, members of the appellate body, uh, referred to the dispute settlement system as an extraordinary achievement that comes close to a miracle. Now, the success uh, are, even in numbers, are, are clear. Uh, number of disputes being brought before the WTO, the number of decisions rendered by panels, and the very good record of decisions being uh, complied with by WTO members. And much of the credit uh, for the success lies in uh, an institution which was created at the end of the Uruguay round together with the WTO, and it's the appellate body. Uh, often referred to as the World Trade Court. Now, um, the upper body is a permanent uh, body. Uh, it, it deals with issues of law. It has its own working procedures. Uh, its decisions have uh, presidential uh, value, at least vis-a-vis -vis panels. And, and it has a has adopted a very uh, clear and consistent, one would say, uh, approach to interpretation, very faithful to text and context. Now, in other words, uh, the appellate body has achieved a level of independence and credibility and, and so legitimacy that any adjudicative body uh, would aspire to. That's one shouldn't be too difficult to sort of make the conclusion that this system does indeed uh, strongly connected uh, with uh, an idea of a rule of law, uh, at least in international law. And this has been uh, a point being made by, by many. Now, is it a bliss uh, then? Uh, well, if you visit Geneva today, uh, I'm afraid to report uh, it's not a, a bliss at all. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. The WTO system, the jewel in the crown of the WTO, is in, on the brink of paralysis. What has happened? Well, while some of the rumblings have started about 10 years ago, uh, the current United States administration has blocked the appointment of any new appellate body members since 2017. So since October 2018, few months ago, there's only three out of seven upper body members left. Uh, it's still operational because the upper body operates in divisions of three, but by the end of this year, when the terms of two of the three remaining members expire, there is serious risk that the dispute settlement system as a whole uh, will come to a halt. So the question is, has the dispute settlement system, particularly the appellate body that sits at the apex and in the center of it, is it a curse? Now, this is a slightly quite an important question and not just for the world of trade. Um, this is a time when, as has been just mentioned, uh, there is thinking about creating a similar court in the investment uh, treaty community. And much of the inspiration for that international investment court comes from the WTO dispute settlement system. So what is wrong? Now, in order to answer the question, I think we need to focus on what are the reasons for such impending paralysis. Now, and it's easy. You look at the United States uh, Trade Representative, the USDR, they've actually put out reports. It's an early report. Uh, you look at their more recent one, and there's a long list of things that they are not happy with. Uh, the United States has grown increasingly concerned with the activist approach of the upper body. And they cite different certain procedural issues and substantive interpretations. I'll give you some examples. With regard to procedural issues, for example, the U.S. has complained that the appellate body members have continued to serve on the appellate body after the expiration of their terms in order for them to complete the disposition of a case that was assigned to them before the expiry of the term. 
This is in line with uh, the working uh, procedures, the, the rules on, on, uh, on procedures of the appellate body. Although these rules haven't been uh, approved by the political arm of the WTO, uh, but only notified to them, uh, although there's no need to, according to uh, the strict uh, text of the DSU. With regard to substantive rules, uh, the United States has complained that the APLA body has interpreted some of the WTO agreements, adding to or diminishing U.S. rights or obligations, something which is expressly prohibited by uh, the dispute settlement understanding. Now, the U.S. has also raised certain concerns that perhaps relate more directly to the way the appellate body exercise its own appellate functions. For example, the U.S. has complained that the real purpose of the dispute settlement system is not to produce reports or to make law, but rather to help members resolve trade disputes among them, right? That's the function. Also, the U.S. has complained that the appellate body, without an express basis in the DSU, claims that its reports are entitled to be treated as precedent by subsequent panels. Also, there's something wrong. Now, are these the causes of the paralysis, right? That's the question. Is the U.S. in this case unhappy with the appellate body application of its own rules or procedures? Is it unhappy with certain interpretation of specific obligations? unhappy with presidential effect of upper body decision. I mean, this would appear to be the case. Although if this were the problems, then what would be the solution? Uh, one would argue that the U.S. would not be happy with a dispute settlement system with strong rule of law features, a so-called rule-oriented system often referred to the WTO dispute settlement system. And the solution would then be going back to the old gut practice of dispute settlement. No presidential effect, no consistency, no coherent jurisprudence, which Professor Weiler has famously called diplomacy through other means. Now, in my view, these are not the real problems. It is not really about working procedures, a particularly restrictive or expansive interpretation, or the fact that the appellate body believes that the world, that the appellate body behaves as a world trade court. I think to me this seems to be just pretenses. The real issue is rooted more deeply within the WTO system. It is not, I believe, in any way, in any specific way, linked with its dispute settlement system. So in my opinion, the real issue is two-pronged. The first prong, it, it is about the realization, I think it's more the feeling of certain members, that the substantive rules of the game, whether as written or as interpreted, are inadequate and unfair in the sense that they do not, any longer perhaps, correctly regulate the matter at hand or even pursue the appropriate objectives. And the second prong, it is about the realization, that's more than a feeling here, that it is almost impossible to bring about any change of those rules. In an institution of 164 members, with different economies, different objectives, uh, different priorities, that operates on the basis of consensus. And here we are. I don't pretend to go into the details of whether changes are really indeed needed, uh, which changes are needed, and, and how to obviate the problem. I just wanted to highlight that what appears to be a problem with a, a rule of law system dispute settlement system is not really the problem. You may say that the dispute settlement system is perhaps the victim of its, of its success. The, the lack of a strong and efficient uh, decision-making arm, political decision-making arm in the WTO, 
compared to a very strong and efficient dispute settlement system may be the cause, but in fact, the cause is the lack of an efficient political making uh, body within the WTO. So, um, in, in conclusion, uh, this is, uh, the problem is not with the dispute settlement system, uh, and any long-term solution should not be focused on dismantling uh, the rule of law features of the WTO, but in fact to address uh, whether the WTO needs and its substantive rules need uh, reform. And thank you for listening.